Well, hello again, everyone. I'm Jerry Rackley, and I want to welcome you to our session today. Uh, thank you for joining us. We have a great presentation that's sponsored by Citrix and with their Go to Webinar solution for online meetings. And we have a great presentation that's going to be brought to you by Pam Slim, and we'll get to her in just a moment. But let me cover a few housekeeping details first. We are recording our session today. And if you are interested in viewing it again or sharing it with others, you can do that. You'll receive an email message from us later today that has a link to the recording as well as a PDF copy of the slides. So that information will come to you. We'll also welcome your questions. So if you have something you would like to ask, please use the console that you have for this meeting. There is a question input area. We'll be monitoring that. And you can submit your questions, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Let's take a look at the agenda. I'll put that up on the screen. We also have a number of ways for you to interact with us through social media. Uh, Demand Metric has a Twitter handle, as does Pam, our presenter. And so we'll put some of that information up on the screen as well. And we invite you at the end of our session today to continue this discussion on Facebook. And so we'll share some information with you about that as well. Let me get to our presenter and talk about Pam. Pam is the owner of Ganas Consulting. She also is an author. In addition to that, Pam's a seasoned coach and writer who helps frustrated employees in corporate jobs break out and start their own businesses. She's a former corporate manager and entrepreneur, and she deeply understands the questions and concerns that first-time entrepreneurs have. She's got expertise in personal and business change that came through years of consulting inside corporations like Cisco, HP, and Charles Schwab, where she coached thousands of executives, managers, and employees. You see some information on the screen about how to connect with Pam, and I encourage you to do that. So Pam, what I'll do right now is I'm going to hopefully click all the right buttons, and we'll turn the presentation over to you and let you begin. So... Let me uh, click on you as presenter, and you should now be driving. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. I am totally delighted to be here. Let me just click into slide view. And thanks to everybody for joining. I'm uh, so thankful for Demand Metric and also for Citrix for being such great partners. It's always really fun to participate knowing you have great support. So. Uh, as Jerry was saying, I am an author and a business coach and have spent a lot of time working with people to both launch their businesses and also to develop really clear, engaged connections with community. Building community is one of the things that I love the most. It goes back to my early days before I got into business when I studied international development in Latin America. And that's definitely the framework that I'll be uh, using today as we're talking about building connections with customers that eventually lead to more sales because I think there is a really strong connection. One of the ways that I love to start is with a quote, and this is from a good friend of mine, Bob Berg. And this is from a book, one of the books that he wrote called Go-Givers Sell More. And Bob says, genuinely great salespeople are not great because they have mastered the close or because they could shoot holes in any customer objection from 50 places. They're great because they create a vast and spreading goodwill wherever they go. They enrich, enhance, and add value to people's lives. They make people happier. And I, I think fundamentally, when, when you look at Bob and everything he's done, he's a great speaker if you ever get a chance to hear him. Um, this is really, I think, more of an approach to sales in the 21st century, where it's not so much how much advertising budget we have, but yet how strong a connection can we create with people and really based on a position of generosity. So the way we're gonna be approaching this today is by looking at some foundations about how I look at sales and marketing, ways that you can really define as experts what is that kind of information that you feel like your potential customers are really gonna know and want. I call it a content map uh, for looking at your marketing and sales. Look at some best low cost strategies to get prospective customers excited about your expertise. I'll share some of my favorites and I also look forward to some of yours. Uh, how to scale a high touch approach to marketing. And we'll do a little bit of live hot seat, which should be fun. And then also how to pull through the sales cycle without feeling pushy. That is something I know that can make many people feel uncomfortable if you're in that classic mode of being the pushy salesperson of just, 
hoping and begging and pushing somebody to make a sale. I don't think anybody really relates to that anymore. And there are ways to still be very proactive, but more to pull somebody through the sales cycle willingly rather than trying to push them through. So first, I just wanted to get a little bit of background on you. If you wouldn't mind answering in the question panel uh, uh, who you are like, and where are you from, what part of the world are you calling in from, and also what is your business? I had gotten some feedback and research from Demand Metric before I started this webinar when we were designing it, and I see that many of you uh, do come from companies that are maybe zero to a hundred employees. So a little bit on the smaller business side, which I thought was really interesting. A lot of you, um, at least within demand metric, are coming from agencies or consulting, software and technology. And I think those are all areas, you know, amongst many others, of course, but I think, you know, a lot of those areas are ones that naturally lend to this particular approach of sharing your, your expertise as a way to really engage in sales. So, um, Great. Pam, we're somebody getting through. We're, we're getting some responses in our question panel. We've got David from Ohio, who's in healthcare, and Todd, who is from Northern California and with a marketing services company, uh, and Maurice, who's in Atlanta doing web design. Uh, and we're getting a great number of responses. So thanks to everyone. That's excellent. I love it. Right, I see Northern California, Oakland. That's the last place I lived, I'm from the Bay Area myself, so it's good to see some Bay Area folks uh, from Brazil. Tudo bem? Eu falo português. From our Brazilian friend, I can bust out a little Portuguese for you. Um, that's great. It's really cool to see some of you calling from the Cayman Islands and so forth. So that's great. I love uh, to look at some of the variety of, of what it is that you're doing. Um, and I think part of what is required when we look at some different strategies is after looking at maybe some of the ideas that might spur inspiration, then you can think of how could I actually apply it? How are some ways we can take these general concepts based on the kind of company that you have and come up with some really creative ideas? So it's great. I'm so happy to have all of you here. So let's see. So the, one of the frameworks I wanted to share is from somebody who I, I worked with. He was my client for a long time. His name is Skip Miller, and he wrote a book called Proactive Selling. And I worked with him. I helped to grow his business. He's in Northern California, actually, in Los Gatos, and does a lot of sales training. And working with him for many years, I, I was one of those people that was very sales averse when I first started my consulting practice. I started my, my consulting practice about 17 years ago. August 15th, I celebrated 17 years. And so the first 10 years or so, I was doing larger scale change management projects and lots of training and development for corporate clients. And I remember that I came to Skip and I said, you know, I really don't, I'm not comfortable selling. I really don't like to sell. And he said, well, wait a minute, how do you get clients? You actually have a continual role of clients. And I said, I know I do, but you know, they just kind of come to me and I do work for them and they refer me to other people. And he said, that's actually selling. You just need to tighten up a little bit your approach, you don't have to change the kind of person that you are if you're more of a collaborative relationship based person. You just need to understand that selling actually happens in a process. And understanding this process was something that's been very, very important to me as a business person and also as a business coach. The framework that comes from proactive selling is looking at five major steps within the sales process. And the first one is initiate. And that can be the very first time that you have contact with a client. So for those of you that are on the call where we've never had the chance to meet, this is an example of some initial kind of connection. We meet on a webinar, maybe we go to a conference, we meet there, some kind of networking event. And when you're first engaging with potential customers in, in the initiate stage, all that you're trying to figure out is really do you have a connection and is there a business reason for you to continue talking with each other? So that's why when you have these initial conversations, all you're trying to do is just, you know, get to know the person, figure out a little bit about what they're doing, what their needs are. And if you do find that, wow, you know, you actually, you know, you build websites, that's so cool because I actually need to build my website. And then that would be a case where you say, that sounds great. Maybe we can set up a time to talk next week and we can figure out more specifically what it is that you're looking for. That can move you to the second stage in the sales process, which is probably the one that takes the most time, depending upon the business that you're in, which is educate. And that's where you learn as much as possible from your client about what's going on with them, what's their business plan, what are they trying to do, what are their strategic objectives, what are their goals this year. 
and then they also can learn about you. Who are you? What is your expertise? What's other work that you've done for clients? And, and this is really the stage where you're doing a lot of qualifying, where you're figuring out, do they have the immediate interest? Do they have a need? Do they have the budget for what it is that you're doing? And so when you have that conversation, then that's when you can really figure out if it makes sense to have a clear offer. That's moving to that next stage, which is validate. That's usually where you're anchoring the value of the solution that you might do something like give them a proposal, or if you have you know, an online solution, you've been discussing things, you could send them to a sales page. That's when they're going to go through the process of, of justifying. Do they have the budget? Are they sure you're the right person? For any of you who might sell directly to consumers, then sometimes if it's an ind independent business owner, sometimes they need to talk to their spouse to figure out if they really can, um, you know, can afford the particular purchase. The last step is deciding. So they're making a decision, yes or no. And that's one of the things I remember that Skip really drove uh, home for me in our work together is that really the ultimate thing in, in a clean, efficient sales process, of course, the better kinds of prospects you get earlier on is great, right? Where you're qualifying early in the educate stage, but ultimately you just wanna have people make a decision. And if they decide they don't wanna work with you, then you can be disappointed for a minute if it's an ideal client, but then at least you can move on. And one of the things that Skip would always say is yeses are great, nos are great, maybes will kill you. That it's not knowing if somebody is really gonna be a client, hanging out in this weird maybe land is something that can really be frustrating and, and frankly is a real drain on your time, energy, and resources. So the reason why I'm showing this framework first for us to talk about selling and relationship selling and, and uh, selling your expertise is sometimes what happens is people feel pressure really early on, like in the initiate stage, to do a really big push to get to the last step in the sales process. So we might spend an hour together and then all of a sudden it, you would, you know, I would make a huge big sales push at the end of this hour and it might feel really awkward. You might be connected, you might like the content, but then at the end of the hour, if you realize that everything, everything's been an elaborate setup in order for me to try to get your money right now today, if it's the first time that we met, that is often, I think, where people can feel uncomfortable. So for you as a salesperson, it can make you feel uncomfortable. And certainly as a consumer, it can make you feel uncomfortable. I think the key is not that it's ever bad, but you know, I don't, I don't mean to say that you can never have a webinar where you might be doing some kind of a product intro, but I think the key here is that you're really clear and upfront with people about what's going on. And when you realize that you need to nurture the process, you need to really have people get to know you, that's when you can relax a little bit and realize you can share some really good information that's useful as long as you have a connection. And follow steps. So I'm not sure if any of you have had any of those experiences or if it's been awkward, I know for me it always feels a little bit jarring if I'm just getting to know somebody and all of a sudden they go for a huge big sale. It's kind of like going on a first date with somebody and having them drop to one knee and propose marriage. It's just way too early. So that's something I think you should really be paying attention to. So that's, that's the framework that we're talking about here in, in terms of the sales process. So there are different things that we can do at different stages of the sales process to really help people move through it to the point where they feel great about their decision, they have all the information they need, and you have the information you need from them in order to really serve their, serve their needs. So that leads us to the second piece of really understanding the framework for the kind of content that we're sharing, and that is really looking at what your people need. That to me is everything about the framework for really great content is where you deeply understand what is it about your customers? What are they trying to do? What can you help them with? Sometimes as salespeople, we get so focused on thinking about our own thing. So, you know, we want to sell our product and we want to tell them as much as possible about the particular product. What we miss is that they're not first thinking about our product. They're thinking about solving their own problems. So what are the areas where they really need some information? And that's where you can come in and really be helpful. So one of the ways that I recommend doing that is by creating a content map. If you've ever seen mind mapping before, you can do it just with a straight piece of paper where you can put the, the name of the customer in the middle 
maybe your, your ideal client avatar, if you've ever done avatar work for marketing where you identify the specific characteristics of an ideal customer, and then you can brainstorm what are all the different things that they need. So I remember when I was doing this for my business, I, which at Escape from Cubicle Nation, my ideal client avatar was somebody who was very creative, who had a very solid business idea, who grew up in a corporate environment, who was really at a place where they were ready to take action on really developing their business idea. So I put that client avatar in the middle, and then I thought of what are all the different things that they need in order to make that decision. So for my folks, it was how do I get health insurance, and, and how do I create a business plan and do I need a website and what's my brand name and what's my business model going to be? I don't know anything about marketing, but how can I find out about marketing and sales? So there's this huge map of content that you can, you can create that really is identified by all the different needs of your customers. Now, the example I'm giving you here was one that I did just specifically, um, you know, knowing folks, I had worked with them for a while, I had written my blog, Escape from Cubicle Nation, for quite a while, and was, I felt like I really had my ear to the ground in terms of the kinds of things that people needed. If you don't feel like you're so connected, then that's really a great reason to do something that might be a very specific kind of market research. So you might want to do a survey. Um, you can do surveys now, as you know, with panels where you might get a group of people that are, you know, identified. This, of course, would be a paid survey, but you might want to identify, you know, here's really what I'm looking for. Here's my customer segment. And let me specifically understand what really are their business needs so you can really tie your messages and your content specifically to that. Uh, my friend here in Arizona, Susan Beyer, has a company called Audience Audit. Uh, and she does a lot of that work. And it's amazing how much information you can get when you're really leaning in to figure out what actually are the, the uh, business conditions of, um, of your customers and what are the problems that they want to solve. So from doing this, from kind of going through the mind mapping process, now if you work in a team, that could be a great thing to do but across your teams. For those of you that might come a little bit more from the uh, technology sector, lean in to notice what are the kinds of questions that people are, are asking in tech support or what are people saying at trade shows if you have folks that are there and that's where you can start to really understand um, what it is that people are looking for. Now when you get that basic information then you can really look and create some themes and that's where you can look at what are the overarching areas where you feel like people actually have specific needs that you can help with. So um, again, for my own community, the four main needs that I identified, which I think for those of you that might be more in you know, marketing, consulting, those kinds of businesses, then these, a lot of these I think can, can really be similar. One area was knowledge. So what are specific how-to information that they need in order to do something. Inspiration, often they want examples of people who are doing you know, a really great job that are people that are just like them that have had their problems solved. They, in my case, in my audience, they need promotion. So they wanted me to be using my own platform in order to be really be promoting what they were doing because they, many times if they were starting a business, didn't have as much uh, of a social media platform. And then they also were looking for connection and community. This is one thing you see a lot when there are users of a particular product or people that love to get together that share a common interest, often they really want to have community. So knowing this, knowing that you have these particular needs and these themes, that is where you can begin to really build your content that is going to be very useful because you know, again, it's really anchored in the specific needs of your community. And that's always where you want to start from when you're thinking about what kind of content that you want to develop to share. So from that, when you have an idea and you say, okay, you know, there are, there's some, you know, specific things I could offer. I know when people want to design a website, there's always, you know, the same five questions, like, do I need to do it on WordPress? You know, what, do I need to have a banner? You know, what should the URL be? Things like that. And, um, and from that particular perspective is where you can, you can begin to develop some content. Now, the places that you just, uh, distribute the content or what I call watering holes. If you imagine a big ecosystem where you have a watering hole, which is one place where many, many people or animals in my visual <laughs> come together um, in one place. And so some examples of watering holes can be places like conferences, 
or blogs or local meeting places. Sometimes if you have a local business, everybody hangs out at the same restaurant or bar, you know, Starbucks, something like that. Uh, there can even be things like concerts where depending upon your business, a lot of uh, ideal, your ideal avatar might be people who like a certain kind of music, which would be a great place for you to be, maybe for you to be a sponsor. There can be geographic locations where you have a high density of certain kinds of people. I know when I used to do consulting in Silicon Valley, obviously it's known for really smart startup tech people and that can be a great place to be if you have a business that serves those kinds of clients. And then also there are a lot of online social media groups. So you can have LinkedIn groups, you have Facebook groups, uh, on Twitter you can have groups, you know, search different hashtags. And these are ways <clears throat> for you really to maximize your efforts that you're looking for places that have a high concentration of your ideal clients. These are really, um, really key things when you're beginning to build your low cost content and, and sales strategies. I say content because really the framework that I'm, I'm coming from as uh, using our expertise is really the way that <clears throat> you can be demonstrating value is really by sharing what it is that you know. So that's why I'm using, using the term content. So that's, that's the framework. So we're thinking about the sales cycle, right? That we want to always give the chance to get to know somebody, really let people naturally go through the steps in the sales cycle so you're not trying to push for a close first thing when you just meet somebody at a conference or you know meet with them in a webinar or something like that. Um, and then you're always thinking about developing specific content that is related to their needs, to the things that they articulate, which in most cases don't include your product name, right? They might say, I want to have a website, but they're not going to say that they need this particular person in order to be, to be building my website. So here are some of my favorites, and, and one starts with something I've actually been doing for about the last five years. So this is a free calls, and I have this on my site. It's actually on the home page of my site, but this is an example of what I have on that free call page. And what I do is the first Wednesday of every month, I host a free call, and people can sign up on email for that list. And for an hour, uh, I, I use GoToWebinar, I'm proud to say, <laughs> that people log in and uh, they can just ask any kind of question they want. So let's say, you know, all of us were in that call right now, you would either be loading up questions like you're doing here when you were, were responding, so I can take the questions that way, or I could unmute you and we, we could have a live interaction. And so on that call, what I found over the last five years, it's been really amazing that one of the really important parts of this is that it is very casual. There is very live targeted interaction. It's like one of those brain exercises for me because I never know what kind of questions I'm going to get. So it, it definitely keeps me on my toes. It can be everything from what kind of technology should I use? Is my business model sound? To my husband doesn't want me to start a business. What should I do? So there's really all kinds of variety in the content. But the key in this kind of offering thinking about it being something you might do in the initial stage of really getting to know your customers is just to be as tremendously useful as you can. So if you have a team, let's say for example, that you address um, technology issues, then you would want to bring maybe folks on that kind of call that were your total aces, that love to solve problems, that love to give information, um, and this would be the kind of great thing to share. One critical thing I think for this particular strategy is that you don't do a lot of pushing selling on this kind of call because the whole idea is is this is a place where if people have a question they can just bop in at any time and there's not going to be any pressure. Uh, it's very useful for <clears throat> some of you who might be sole proprietors or maybe you have a small consulting business. If you do get fairly well known you get a lot of questions. You get a lot of questions via email and I know for a number of years I tried to respond to all of them and then just found it was taking all of my time and obviously generating zero revenue. So this way I have a place to always send people if they have a question. I have actually a pre-prepared um, template that says you know thank you so much for your question. Unfortunately I don't have time to answer each one individually but I would love to have you submit your question to my free call and I hope you know hold it the first Wednesday of the month and that way it gets people kind of going into this um, into this process. 
a critical thing that does lead to sales after that is where you have that great interaction, you have the email from somebody, and then that's where you can be following up with useful information, with resources. We'll talk a little bit later in this webinar about some specific things that you can do to nurture and follow up. But uh, I cannot tell you how many times that I have heard from new clients that you know, I was I've been listening to your pre-calls for the last you know 12 months, or you know I was trying to decide whether or not to come to this retreat that you offered, and then I, you know, attended your free call, and that that really tipped it for me. So it's a very natural, organic uh, kind of sales tool, but I find it to be very powerful because if you have a knowledge-based business, this is the way that you demonstrate what you are about, and you can obviously show your style. Uh, as a coach or a consultant live because everybody is really listening to how it is that you do it. So this has been an extremely effective strategy for me and, and something that I encourage you to be considering regardless of, of what kind of business that you have. One thing for those of you who might have something um, that is, you know, maybe not exactly the, the kind of business that, you know, tons of people would be interested in uh, hearing from Michael, I was just um, Michael from the UK. You were saying you do materials handling, for example, right? So I'm not sure exactly about who your ideal customers are. It could be that there are some specific things that you offer that are, you know, maybe people wouldn't want to drop everything that they're doing to come to a free call. But if you look in the broader sense about what are your ideal customers doing when when they're, you know, talking about materials handling, is there something about building, you know, transportation, any kinds of issues? where you can really be fueling a useful discussion to be answering their broader questions is going to be positioning you as an expert. And when they get to know you in that way, that's when, when they do have materials handling issues, then you're going to be the kind of person that they're thinking about. So Michael, I kind of unfairly picked on you because I saw that, you know, personally I thought, hmm, you know, how could that strategy cross? But that might be a case where you think of the broader context of what are business issues people have. And if, if you or your staff don't want to do it directly, then you could maybe uh, have other experts that come in. It's a really great way to be, you know, addressing needs with other partners, which is, again, another way to, to get exposed to new people within your market. So what I'd love to do in just a minute, I want to give folks a chance to volunteer if anybody wants to, but I wanted to demonstrate some of what can happen when you do this live call. And don't worry, I won't really you know, put you on the hot seat, ask you really deep questions about your childhood or anything like that. <laughs> but we can do a little bit of brainstorming and I want to demonstrate in that kind of conversation the power that can happen when people are listening in when we're doing a live call. So probably the only caveat, sometimes we get a little bit of feedback if you're calling in with, with voice over IP. So if some of you is calling in on the phone, that might be the best case. But why don't you go ahead and, and volunteer. If you maybe want to be uh, volunteered for that hot seat, then just let us know. And uh, Jerry can unmute you at the right moment, and we can have a little conversation to talk about it. OK, so we're looking for volunteers. And Pam, let me just uh, point out that uh, Ali suggested a local chambers of commerce as a, a watering hole. That is fantastic. I love that idea. And actually, I've had one of my dear friends who's a former client who had been a sales and marketing manager who was laid off and he decided to pursue a lifelong interest in photography. And one of the ways that he built up his now thriving photography business is to volunteer at the Chamber of Commerce here in Mesa, Arizona. And he's gotten so much business from that, I can't even tell you. So, Ali, you are absolutely right. That can be a really fantastic thing. If, in his case, his name is Ivan Martinez, and in his case, he really was looking for business clients to do business photography. So it's a really great suggestion. <clears throat> okay, so one, one of the, another strategy, we talked about free calls. Another really great strategy to uh, beginning to uh, to begin to connect with your customers and be shown as somebody who really has value and expertise in an area is to share content. Now, FreshBooks is actually another Canadian company, so I'm waving. You know, I know Demand Metric is based in Toronto, as is FreshBooks, and it's funny. I, I've been a FreshBooks customer, you know, for a long time uh, when I was first starting my business, and, and I just found that they had such a great connection with their audience. They're very social media friendly. And they're really known as being useful and very responsive uh, with their customer base, which again is a really important part of 
building this kind of relationship where people want to do business with you. But one of the things they did when they leaned in and noticed the kinds of problems that their ideal customer base were facing, a lot of their, their customers and prospective customers are freelancers, writers, you know, independent folks who really struggle with pricing. Who, who want to get away from just charging for you know hourly fees for what it is that they're doing. So they put together, Mike McDermott, who's the CEO, put together an ebook which is called Breaking the Time Barrier that was really, really well done. And it went through and gave really great advice and information to folks about how it is that you can get away from just charging by the hour. And they got some great press, you know, some great blurbs. It was a, the way that they structured it. I think they specifically, you know, shared it with people who were high profile, exactly like you would do if you had a regular book where you were trying to get high profile endorsements. And they ended up getting a lot, a lot of shares and downloads. And this is something that they did for free. Um, an interesting twist that they did is they also offered if anybody wanted to, if anybody felt like they wanted to pay for it, they could just pay whatever value it is that they felt they received. And I, I think the highest they received is something like $200, uh, which was amazing. Somebody said, yes, this is worth $200 to me. So even though they could just get it for free, they, they ended up paying for it. So I thought this is a really great example. If we think in the, in the context of the content map, they went right to the heart of what is a core struggle for people that are in their target audience and how can we create a really great, useful piece of content that's going to be helpful for them. So this, this is one example of sharing uh, vibrant, what I call vibrant content, something that's really, really useful and, uh, and, and helpful. Another strategy is one I just saw when I was in Boston last week for Inbound 2013, which is HubSpot's uh, user conference. And I was walking through the hallway, I was going up the, the stairwell, and I noticed this huge line of people that were lined up and then I saw that there was somebody uh, you might have a hard time seeing it right here there's somebody in the background that's by the window that was smiling and there was a photographer that was taking a picture and I, I kind of my dad's a photographer so I'm always interested whenever I see photography so I walked up there and they had this really clever sign that was placed and they had a picture that looks like it was from 1998 this really horrible background and this guy and then a beautifully lighted contemporary revised headshot and their tagline said it's 2013 there's no excuse to have a crappy headshot on LinkedIn Let's and to have an updated LinkedIn profile and they share that picture for free now, what I learned about SmartShoot, I didn't know anything about them before, but I was kind of intrigued as I saw what they were doing. I thought it was a great marketing uh, technique. And what they do is, is they're kind of a clearinghouse where people are looking to find professional photographers. So it's kind of like a specific Elance, but just for photographers. So you can look for folks that are experts in taking headshots or product shots or, or whatever you're looking for. And that to me was just such a great, great, well-strategized, well-placed kind of giveaway because they got brand exposure people were curious about it they had some humor in the way that they set it up and then what are people going to do when they get a beautifully taken headshot they're going to share it all over and say thanks at smart shoot you know for that free photo that was so nice and so they get the benefit from some great social media sharing in addition to exposing people to what it is that they're doing so i thought that was a really really imaginative and great thing the key is is they were sitting directly in a watering hole. At in, uh, Inbound, there were 5,000 people that were really their ideal audience that were you know, small to medium-sized business, that were very social media savvy, that were the you know, typical people that could be users um, of their services. So I just thought you know, in all ways, they just hit it right in the middle of the bullseye of the target for being in a watering hole with a kind of thing that people were really going to appreciate that solved a specific need. Now, another thing which is very familiar to folks who are in the software world is where you have uh, free trials. And this is something from 37 Signals, which is a software company. I, I picked one of, their, one of their products, which is called High Rise, where they do their contact management. And you can see they actually have it kind of in small letters because strategically, you know, you have, they're, they're wanting to, you to, to be aware of what their pricing is and, and to sign up for it. But you see on the bottom in this middle thing, that's the plus service, 30-day free trial on all accounts. It's a very well-known tactic that's used by software companies 
where you can sign up for free. Usually you have to provide your credit card information upon signing up. But what it does is it totally reduces that barrier to entry so that when you are signing up for free, people, if they like it, they get used to it, they begin to use it for 30 days, and then a lot of people don't want to give it up once they have used it. So that's one way of sharing, in this case of, of a product or you know, particular software, where there really is no risk uh, to, to the customers who are signing up. And it just says, hey, like you get the full use, sometimes the full use, sometimes people have some limitations on what you can do for your 30-day free trial, but it is a great way in order to get people very familiar with what you're offering. Now, I think you can be creative about that, right? Maybe you have a membership site where you share you know, member information where people can sign up for the first 30 days for free. You spend a lot of effort and energy in those 30 days connecting with them, making sure they get access to the information, encouraging them to connect with other people that might be in that community, making sure that experience is a really good one. Uh, I've done it before sometimes when I teach uh, classes. Some, I have series of classes sometimes. I teach classes about growing a business. And if I have somebody who's like, you know what, I think I want to do it, but I'm not really sure if it's like the perfect fit, I'll just say, hey, you know what, why don't you just try it, like the first 30 days. And if you feel like it's a good fit, that's great. If not, that's no problem. And I think, once again, it just creates this very collaborative, peer-based, value-based kind of perspective where you're not trying to really like go down the finish line to get them to close. Saying that, what, what I'm not saying is, it, you know, this would only be used in the case of having somebody who is a really strong prospect, where you knew that they were, you know, somebody who would, you would love to work with. And in that case, then it can make a lot of sense. But if it's not a good prospect and you're just like dragging somebody in because they're not, you know, they're not really ideal, then I don't think it can work as well. But this could be for somebody who you think is an ideal client profile. They're really wanting to do it. They're just on that edge. And again, it doesn't have to be 30 days. It could be five days. It could be 10 days. The key is to give them the full experience of what it's actually like to work with you. And that, that can be very powerful. All right, another idea um, about sharing content is one that would certainly be, it's more, it's more expensive. This is not really a, a free tactic necessarily, but some of you who might be doing more B2B sales, one thing I think would be amazing, I, I chose the example of South by Southwest Interactive, which is a huge conference in Austin, Texas, that brings together tons of people that are in technology and social media and you know, authors and all kinds of things. It was actually where I first met Citrix. I was introduced to uh, some friends from Citrix by, by mutual friends in the Bloggers Lounge. And it's an amazing place to connect, to learn about latest, the latest technology. Uh, you meet, you know, anybody you admire in business is usually there presenting. So as an interesting idea, as a way to really be engaging with your customer, if there's somebody who you know you've been courting for a while, it's a really big deal, you could invite them to go with you. Buy them a ticket to the event, have them you know, hang out with you, have a great shared experience. And that could be something that would be amazing where they really see you, you know, live in action. This can be something you can tailor as well. I pick South by Southwest because I think you know, for many of our markets, this could be a place that has some good customers. But whatever would be the equivalent of a place that would just be good for them to go for their own business. They would be so thankful and appreciative of it because it really opens up opportunities for them. But then it also allows them to be interacting with you and your business and your customers. It builds much more a sense of community. So this, I think, could be another really interesting idea. Um, if you produce live events, this can be a case where you choose to have certain tickets that you might be sharing to the event for some of your, you know, key prospects and people who you would love to, to invite. You might have a bunch of folks who are paid users that are coming, but then if you mix in people who, again, can really experience the live event, see everybody else there, see the excitement of people who are paying for the event, it can be a really amazing way to be, uh, to be helping to move them along in the sales process. That's really where I think a lot of shift is going to happen. So for some of this, I think the challenge is, is when you're really trying to scale this high touch. Certainly, if you are sharing your expertise with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, you meet them on an airplane or at a conference and you really share great information, that's wonderful, but it would take a long time in order to really be reaching a lot of customers. So one of the ways um, that we can look at it is by things like hot seats. If we go back to the, the free strategy we had for 
the free calls, then when you are talking to somebody live and you're addressing their particular issue, it can feel for many people who are listening like you're talking directly to them because it's a personal conversation and that's often the way that we process it. It's where you notice for people that are professional speakers, when they're really in their zone, they might be looking out at a particular individual, some member of the audience, and when they get that eye contact with that audience member, everybody in the room can feel physiologically like that speaker is talking directly to them. That's exactly what it is that you want to be building, even in a virtual setting like a webinar. So hot seats are great for that. Um, the other thing that can be very powerful is featured customer case studies. And that's where somebody can know that a, a customer case study is very similar to them. So you would want to choose a customer who is struggling with similar issues. You talk about really what it is that they did in order to resolve their problem, what some of the results were. And that can be something that really builds a lot of confidence and trust in what it is that you're doing. A, a, an important, I think, sense of positioning is that you always want to be positioning yourself as an expert as somebody who is a peer and a partner to your customers. So it's not that, you know, this customer was a disaster, they came to work with us, and then all, now finally their life is better only because they work with us. I don't think that's very empowering for your customers, and you have to be very, very careful uh, about how it is that you position it. I always like to think of ways to be positioning my customers as strong peers, as capable people who just needed the right kind of uh, my own expertise or maybe some coaching for a little bit in order to get them exactly where it is that they needed to go. That is something I think that can really help strengthen your position as an expert um, based on things that your customers are saying within the case studies. So now is when I actually want to choose a live person. We can do a little bit of brainstorming for um, somebody who volunteered to be in the hot seat. So Jerry, do you know who it is that we want to unmute? Yes, we do. Um... Maurice from Atlanta. I'm going okay, to unmute great. you. We appreciate your willingness to be put in the hot seat. So Maurice, you should be unmuted. So if you would say hello to us, we'll get started. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Hi, Maurice. Hi, Pam. I'm a, a huge fan. I uh, listened in on your, uh, you had a, a workshop on Creative Live. Uh, I think it was maybe about a month or so ago. So it's very exciting to talk to you like this. That's so cool. I love that. Well, welcome, welcome. Welcome from Atlanta. So, so Maurice, tell us a little bit about like what your business is and what are some of the thoughts you've had about ways you can share your expertise with your customers? Okay. Uh, well, I have a, a, a small web design business called uh, 318 Media. Uh, right now it's just me, but I'm trying to sort of branch it out into more of a collective that involves other, you know, creatives that are doing the kind of work that I do. But I work primarily with uh, web design, WordPress design, WordPress consulting, and uh, email marketing. Uh, so some of the ways that I've been sort of trying to show my expertise over the years has been doing a lot of, uh, of public speaking. I present at, at conferences locally as well as uh, around the country. Not as much as I used to, more local now. And I work a lot with uh, nonprofit organizations, actually. The, the uh, what's it called, hands-on tech which is a um, uh, offshoot of the points of light organization uh, I do a lot of speaking with them when we talk to our profits about how they can use technology and that was recently picked up <clears throat> excuse me uh, by Google and it was shown on the Google blog so I was really excited about that that happened uh, uh, I think last week so one of the problems I guess that I have with the expertise is even though I'm, I'm doing these things and some of it is getting recognized it's when I put it in front of my customers, I guess, when I show them, you know, kind of the things that we're doing, they don't really seem to be that interested or they don't really care. Yeah, well, it's good. I mean, I love that you're reaching out and doing those things. That's great. And it's wonderful to get those branding pieces. Everything can start to work together as certainly being featured on Google, you know, having partnerships and that expertise can be great. One of the things I think that the place that you might want to go back to a little bit as you go for the core demographic of your ideal client is really going back and figuring out what are the needs that they have where if you're providing information for them on those topics they are going to be tuning in and paying attention right because that's often where you get that disconnect is where they think it's cool that you're sharing information but maybe it's not totally relevant maybe it's you know targeted a little differently it's not directly hitting them where they actually feel like they need the help 
So that's where I'd go back when you think about your ideal customers and who you worked with. You know, what were the main things that you really shared that's unique to your own expertise? And those can be some of the things that you can share. And there can be simple little things uh, nowadays with the young folks of today. You know, I say this as a 47-year-old old lady sometimes. But, you know, the young folks of today uh, that are, you know, maybe the whippersnappers of the young entrepreneurs, like everything they learn is on YouTube, right? We often think of blogs or things like that. But so much of our Gen Y are getting, is getting information on YouTube, but even creating really short clips of like useful information, things that people struggle with answering very specific questions about web design that's targeted toward your ideal customers can be things that, that can be useful. It doesn't have to be you know, a really big thing. So I think you're doing so many of the right things, Maurice. And the key is just to make sure that you're really listening to, for your ideal customers of making sure that you're doing things that they care about. Once you start to do that, I guarantee you they're, they're going to start tuning in more and they're going to be sharing it with their friends. OK. Um, and maybe I guess this is just sort of a follow-up. Uh, I when I have my my email list and I you know I've been working on growing my list and I do a fair amount of uh, list hygiene probably once a quarter just to see who's still active and who's still engaged. Mm -hmm. What are some ways that you can get the people on your list to actually respond and talk to you? I've done surveys, I've done giveaways, and they don't seem to be at all very interested in sort of talking to me about what they need or what what sort of things that I can help them with outside of a project basis. Yeah, it, it, it's a good question. I can talk a little bit about email marketing and some of that could be a good follow up with some suggestions I can share um, on the Facebook page. We have GoToWebinar that what Jerry is going to be sharing is GoToWebinar has a post for this particular call where I can probably locate some specific information on that. You know, not looking at it, like what I would normally do is look at it and say, okay, what's the nature of your communication? You know, what are you sharing on an ongoing basis? Are you connecting also in social media in addition to email? But often what I find is like short, quick kinds of requests for information or things that often, you know, people can respond to more. And a lot of it can be where you might pay attention to what's going on with your customers or your prospects and you can be sharing information with them that way. So let me follow up a little bit on that with you, Maurice on that uh, go to webinar Facebook page, uh, okay. but I will share a couple other things when I talk about email um, in the next couple minutes. And thanks okay. for volunteering. I totally oh, thank, appreciate it. Thank you so much for your knowledge. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Maurice. So we can go ahead and uh, mute up Maurice again. So, so a dynamic that happened, as, as each of you, you were listening to me for most of this webinar has been me just talking, right, sharing information. As soon as it shifts to having more of a conversation, that's where often people tune in a lot more for folks who are checking the different uh, statistics about webinars and noticing when people are paying attention. Then often when you have a conversation is really when people are tuning in. I'm not sure if any of you feel that. You're like, oh yeah, I totally get that from Maurice. Or, oh, I have ideas, let me share it with Maurice. All of a sudden it becomes more of a conversation. So even though it's just he and I that are talking about his particular business, there are often things that really relate to other customers that have issues. And so even if you found, like in this case, I couldn't answer every single question. I don't have the really short, like perfect answer to the email question. But again, thinking about the continuum of follow-up that you have with folks, always have places you can go after a certain engagement, after a speaking engagement, after a webinar, where you can provide follow-up information. And that's where you really begin to build some connection. So these are just you know a few examples of, of things that you can do. So there's just a couple more. Um, slides to share and then I want to get to questions from the rest of you. So I think the main thing to think about when we're talking about the non-pushy sales pull of helping people through this, the, the sales cycle is first to always make sure you really control the process. Know where you are in the sales cycle. If you're in initiate, if you've just met somebody, don't worry about closing a deal today. Think about how can I get to know their needs? How can I ask them so many more questions about what they need in order to figure out what it is that I can share and how can I be very open to let them learn as much as possible about me to help them make a decision. Always know the next step. So when you begin to understand the general process that your customers go through, that's where you can really be prepared and say, okay, after a webinar, after a live sales event, after sharing um, you know, in some kind of an ebook or a product, here's the next piece of information they're gonna need that's what it is that you're going to want to automate and have followed up with some kinds of email follow-up. So you always know where you're going. 
Um, another really important piece is to segment as much as possible. If you have the kind of email system that allows you to be tagging people, to be segmenting, to be really understanding where the different customer segments, then you can make sure for different follow-up you have and content that you share that you're sending it just to the kind of group that you want to send it to. If you have a group of C-level folks, you're probably not going to want to send the same kinds of information as you might to folks who might be working directly in the field with customers. So the more you can segment, really understand your customer prospect base um, in your mailing list, that's really going to be helpful. And then personalizing as much as possible. Address the specific needs of people. If you segment, if you're able to tag things, make sure that you're really personalizing the information so they feel like they're talking directly, like you are talking directly to them. And then always have a clear call to action, right? The call to action for a free thing is to get their email address. If you want to, you know, if you want them to be participating in some kind of a survey, make it really clear. Don't have 50 links in the email, have one that's the only place they can go is really to lead to that next step. And just have the right kind of information available at each step in the sales process. The clarity is something that's really going to help you and, and help your customers to not feel pushed. So I think you know a, a key in, in email nurturing, depending, I'm not sure what kind of email systems that you're using. I'm a, kind of the spokesperson for, uh, <laughs> for Infusionsoft. They're here local, so I'm friendly with them, and so I, I sit right on their website. But that's one example of a system where, where you can do a lot of this tagging, right? You have very specific ways that when people come into your database, you can ask them questions, you can tag where they came from, see what their different behaviors are, and that can be the case for many other systems that you might use, for MailChimp or um, Office, I forget what the, another newer one is, but you know, a constant contact or one shopping cart, whatever you use, you wanna think about what is a way you can intelligently use your mailing list so that you're providing really useful follow-up information. Um, the person who I think is the best at this in the world, is just crazy smart, is Jermaine Griggs. He started a business called Hear and Play, which teaches people how to play music by ear. He started it with his, uh, a piano that his grandmother won on The Price is Right. <laughs> and uh, he is so amazing at how he tags and segments for cu his customers. Uh, Maurice, actually, uh, Jermaine would be a great person to learn from about he asks a tiny little subtle questions as people work their way you know through his site as they purchase different products and through getting this information about his customers he knows exactly how much they spend what they might be ready for next he knows when their birthday is and when to send them a gift and he, he's built an eight-figure business with a very very small staff with something you know as just unique as teaching people how to play music by ear through videos so he's an amazing example of how when you're tagging and personalizing your follow-up, it can make a really big difference in terms of how, how your business grows. So, you know, thinking about that, know where you are in your sales cycle. Don't, don't try to close a deal when you're right in the beginning. And I think the main thing for us to be thinking about today is it's really your customers who are going to be determining your true value and expertise, right? If you're really listening to what they want, you serve them relentlessly, then that's where, it, with a well-organized sales process, the sales are really going to follow. So let's, uh, let's go to some questions in the remaining minutes and see what's, what's on your mind. Okay, Pam. Well, we do have a few questions, um, and so bear with me. Uh, Jim asked this question. He says, if you have an intangible business like tech and consulting like yours, are you using PowerPoint slides for part of your monthly free call to add a visual element, perhaps with the same basic slides to cover the basics? Or what do you do to add a visual element for the user to help keep them engaged? That's great, Jim. You know, I've actually changed a little bit. I started out just doing the telephone call, so everything was just on the phone, which for people who are highly auditory learners, it was great. But you're right, it's missing some of the visual cues. One thing that I've started to do is to host it via a webinar because I don't know what questions are being asked. What I what I do do is I have generally just a placeholder slide where you know people know what kind of call that they're on. But let's say we were you and I were talking about uh, you know one particular service that you might want to check out. I would actually go live on my computer because people see my screen and I would call up that site and then I I, I could show that. So the some of the distinction could be if you're hosting a free call where you know that there's uh, pre-prepared content, then I think always having interactivity, having slides and visual cues are super helpful. The challenge if you're doing just that 
free, open-ended answering any question is that, you know, I never know what kind of questions are going to come during my pre-calls every month. So it doesn't work as well for that. But I really like that you're thinking about visuals. And I found it's, it's very powerful sometimes to be doing a live Google searching. Just be aware that whenever you go live on the web, sometimes you can hit the wrong key, bring up a site you don't want to bring up. And <laughs> those are things that you want to be prepared for. Thanks, Pam. And here's another question we have. And I think this may be the, uh, we only have time probably for this one, but if you want to keep asking questions, we'll see them and perhaps we can get to them offline. And the question is this, do you think partnering with other businesses to get leads may be useful? For example, if you are in shipping, you can partner with gift wrapping and boxing or, or those kinds of companies. This way you can offer more and you don't have to carry the costs. It's a fantastic idea. I love that. Um, in many ways, what we're doing today with Citrix and Demand Metric and myself is we're demonstrating that, right? We're all coming together. We serve similar markets, but we have a little, we're, we're all in a little bit of different ecosystems. So this is a way that we can reach more people by doing collaboration. And I think it's a great example. You're right. It, it really spreads the risk out. And it also means that you do, you know, have the possibility of really um, being exposed to markets that you might not have been exposed to before. I love that idea. That's a great suggestion. Um, I also saw, Nilda, you were commenting that I, I went through the last couple of slides quickly, which I, I know we are definitely going to be sharing a PDF of all the slides after this call, which Jerry will tell you more about. But just so you know, uh, in the interest of time, I was, I was finishing that up, but you will get access to all the slides after. And let's do talk before we close about how to continue this conversation. Uh, one of the things that I'm going to do is uh, share with you a slide on, on how you can connect with us through Facebook. We also, if you've seen at the bottom of Pam's slides, uh, you've seen that we have a hashtag called Drive Sales. And Pam certainly welcomes you to connect with her through Facebook. And in addition to that, um, you, you can also just uh, connect with us through uh, Twitter. I think Pam's Twitter handle is right there on the screen. Uh, her Facebook address, her website address. So there's lots of ways to connect. And uh, with with that, I think we are at the end of our call. I'm trying to uh, figure out how to get my screen back up, Pam. I may need you to make me the presenter. Okay, let me do that. This is an example of collaboration. So let's see. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's funny, though. I have, with so many names, J. It's not J. Smith, is it? For some reason, I'm not... I think I'm. I think hopefully we're seeing our screen that has the continued discussion with Facebook. This is the Facebook page set up by GoToWebinar. It shouldn't be very difficult to find. If you will go search on GoToWebinar, you should get to this page. Hopefully you'll recognize that image. We invite you to go there. If you prefer Facebook, if you prefer Twitter, you've got the uh, the hashtag Drive Sales as well as a Twitter handle. So. Whichever way you choose, we invite you to keep this discussion going. But we are grateful uh, that you attended, Pam. It was like drinking from a fire hose, just a tremendous amount of quality <laughs> information. So we appreciate you. And, of course, we're very grateful to our sponsor, GoToWebinar, for hosting our session today. So we hope you found it useful. We invite you to send us your feedback. And please let us know how we can help you. Good day, everybody. Bye now. Thanks, everybody.